Hello and welcome to HD's weekly talk show and our ongoing series, Reaching Out with HD, where we bring you interesting people, inspirational stories, and some fun moments. I'm not going to use the term she often uses for her physical disability or imperfection, as some would say, for she has perfected life, taught herself and others some valuable lessons, as also accepted bitter truths. She set up India's first domestic hedge fund and went on to lead a multi-billion asset management company. Radhika Gupta, MD and CEO of a mutual fund house who has recently turned author. On the face of it, she manages people's money, but she knows that it is their dreams that she is helping chisel. In our ongoing series of Reaching Out with HD, we speak to Radhika Gupta, MD and CEO of Edelweiss Mutual Funds in this edition of HD's talk show, The Interview. Welcome to the show, Radhika, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. Let me begin with some life lessons. In life, there are tales of failure, loss, guilt, and fear. Tell me some of yours. Take me through them. These are words you have used at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think fear is an interesting one to start with. Very, very fearless. And I was raised very fearless. But I think there's a certain stage in our life where I wouldn't say fear, but lack of self-confidence sets in. Um, so I, I know that phase. Uh, I know it from my teenage years till my 20s. Uh, you know, challenges particularly about how you look. So I hate looking at my pictures from that era. Now, of course, I have the confidence to laugh over it. You're okay calling yourself the girl with an imperfection. And I'm not going to use the word which you very happily use for yourself. How tough is it? And about yourself, you have said, I hated how I sounded and I hated how I looked. Take me through those trying times. You're probably referring to the fact that I titled the talk, The Girl with a Broken Neck. Look, it's a line I remember being called as a child. It bothered me. Um, and why can't I use it as a title? And you know, the funny thing is, the fact that when I started doing speaking after that, that line accompanied my designations in a lot of talks that I did, tells you that maybe imperfection is also kind of a powerful thing. A lot of people have said, um, why is she chosen to call herself that? Is that a disservice to a CEO of a 20,000 crore company, which it was at that point in time? Uh, and I don't think it's a disservice, right? Uh, because I am the CEO of a 20,000 crore or 80,000 crore company. Um, I'm also a girl. I'm also a girl with vulnerabilities and imperfections. And honestly, neither the company nor the girl with a broken neck is a complete is my complete story. There are many, many facets to it. But that was another side to the story. What is your complete story? Oh, my complete story is still evolving. Um, but uh, I think I am someone who is deeply ambitious. And uh, so that's me. And uh, as my father said, we, we believe at home that every generation should take a leap from the previous generation. Um, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do. I am trying to challenge my potential to do things that are uh, different to challenge the status quo and to live sort of a fearless existence. From a CEO to an author, what did it take? Were they life's bitter lessons or was it simply the urge to see your name in print? You know, it was actually neither. It was just, I, I, there was a couple of things. I genuinely enjoy the process of writing. So I never did the book for fame or getting known or any of that stuff. I love the process of playing with words. And people don't believe me when I say this. I've been writing since I was five years old. You use the word playing with words. Looking at your career, you actually play with money, if you will allow me to use the term. I, You know, I think both can coexist. Uh, my profession is managing money, not playing with money. I knew you would contradict me then. Yeah, you yeah, know, and I should uh, because uh, I'm I'm also very cognizant of the responsibility of managing public money that my 
profession uh, gives me. Um, I think we can have multiple facets to our life. My mother used to say that growing up, I was a strange child because my two favorite subjects were math and English literature. And, you know, they seem at complete polar ends with each other. Uh, and she said when the book came out that it's nice to see that perhaps both came in handy. Um, I, you know, interestingly, a lot of people, my profession is money. Uh, a lot of people ask me the books I read. And usually you'd expect money people to read largely money related books. I probably have read, read five finance books after I graduated from college. I read literature on the weekend and I read fiction uh, and I read some Urdu poetry and that is what I like. Uh, and I always tell people that being a finance profession doesn't mean that you're just that. You know, in interestingly, even money is the study of human behavior. It is learning from experiences, incidences, other industries. Um, and so actually the worlds come together. I do believe personal finance teaches you about life as much as life teaches you about personal finance. In fact, this uh, mix of money and literature and economics was my next question. Because you come across as an emotional person and yet you have a head for figures. How does it work? It intrigues me really. Ah, it, how does it work? I, I've never thought, uh, I've never, you can be very business minded, you can be aggressive, you can know your numbers and you can want the best for your business. And anyone who knows me knows that I am competitive. I am aspirational for the business. And yet you can be emotional with people. Um, so I believe that as, as a person who's managing people, um, I am emotional with people. Um, I am vulnerable with people. I want to be compassionate with people. And yet I'm very aggressive about business. And I do believe compassion and aggression can go hand. Because once you have won trust, you can drive people. You can carry them through bad times. Numbers are not going to carry people through bad times. You know, I in a short five, six year career as stint as CEO, um, I've seen some terrible times in the business. And I've seen some very good ones. And I can tell you in the terrible times, it's not the numbers that hold people back. Uh, it's the emotion uh, that holds people back. Talking of mess ups, you have also had tomatoes thrown at you because you messed up big time at a hedge fund. Did the world then come to an end for you? Yeah, so I think the, the, the tomato, thro the feeling like tomato throwing incident was an early one in my stint as CEO. It was probably like six days in or something like that. Um, and I did this meeting where there, there was just a lot of criticism. And it was, to be fair, to be fair, it was not unwarranted. Uh, criticism. I came into a CEO role thinking I was the queen of the world. Um, and then you quickly realize that there, there is responsibility. Um, the second is, uh, I think we make a lot of mistakes in our career and mistakes are inevitable. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is the Neil Gaiman quote on, you know, make mistakes, go out and make glorious mistakes and big mistakes and stupid mistakes, whatever it is. Um, but also you have to learn to deal with mistakes. Uh, in the right way. You have to learn to deal with mistakes uh, in an honest way. Uh, you have to deal with mistakes in an upfront way. So when the tomatoes were being thrown at me, the easiest solution I found was to say, listen, here's me where we may have gone wrong. Um, and then I found out that people are equally forgiving. In fact, you have said about companies that honest stories travel the distance. Advertising budgets cannot. Will you explain this in the context of what you're saying about mistakes also? I run a brand um, and I think as brands, we spend so much money trying to win consumer love, uh, trying to win people's hearts. Um, you know, we write taglines, we invest in all of this, etc. But finally, you are your actions, right? So when you make a mistake, uh, and Pralat Kakkar told me this once, he said, you know, you're building your brand in a bad time. In your good time, you're actually just marketing it. So it's when you make those mistakes, um, it's when you go wrong, um, it's when you screw up, that people are looking to you to act in a certain way. Uh, and if you got your story right then, if you behave humanly then, if you communicate properly then, that's much bigger than what you've written on a wall.
In your book, you've spoken about the pitfalls of being overweight, wearing thick glasses and braces. Take me through those formative years and maybe one or two instances which completely shattered you. I was getting married I and mean, Delhi is a very cold place to get married in the winter. Um, and it was less related to my braces, it was more related to my neck. And, you know, I mean, being a bride is exhausting, right? So you're standing on the stage and you're wearing the shawl by the end of this reception and, you know, you're almost just done. Um, and then one of these aunts comes to me and she says, you know, you have to straighten your neck. And I was like, listen, it's like three hours into a reception. I'm freezing cold here. Why do I need to straighten my neck? She's like, because your pictures will mean would look bad and this is abnormal. I was like, who are you telling me what is normal or abnormal? And it just, I was like, it's my wedding day, firstly. Um, and it, it sort of really bothered me. Um, the other one, by the way, that used to bother me a lot, which now I laugh off now, is, and I don't know why it bothered me, is the woman at the airport security check. Like, they'll just ask you questions about your neck. I'm like, why do you need to know? And they're like, what's it why, yeah? Problem, why do you need to ask me these things? Uh, and it's, a, it's also a question that perhaps we need to be a little more sensitive to what others are going through or how they look, etc. You know, it amazes me. How, and I, when I use the word amazes me, I really mean it. How you have overcome this, that's one part. And how you can not only laugh about it, but freely talk about it. What did it take? I thank people for it. I genuinely thank people for it. Um, because as I said, when, when the girl with a broken neck released, I had people in their 70s and I had people who were 15. Um, and I still have them till today um, telling me their own stories. And I can't tell you, they're such heartfelt stories that when you look at the inbox, you almost feel privileged to be living and to be part of someone's life in such a way, you know, there will be people who stop you at airports or like I was in BKC recently and someone will say, you know, you told a story like this and this is what it did to me. Like it gave me the confidence to go out and, you know, ignore my weird cheek issue or my this issue or deal with rejection. Um, it's a really privileged thing. You know, you come across as a strong person and yet you tried to end your life, attempted suicide, Radhika. I don't think being strong uh, and having mental health issues is exclusive. I think, uh, in fact, we're living in an India today where I've seen some of the strongest people at work go through real mental health challenges. Uh, and I think it is a reality that uh, all of us cope with. And again, that's one of the reasons I speak as much as I do, um, which is that mental health challenges, feeling low, feeling like giving up, feeling depressed, these are real. What changed you? What was that? I mean, I can't say one incident or one moment, but what changed you? And from what you were to what you have become, which is admirable, how did it happen? And what was the inner transformation? So I have to say, I, I wish there was a single incident because I keep getting asked. And I don't think it's a single incident. I think it is time. I think it is going through a series of failures and rejections but also seeing success um, and um, seeing that things that make you slightly unique, slightly different are also the ones that in some way propel you to succeed. You have compared life to a market. To quote you, it is an aggregate upward graph, much like the markets, but it is not a one way straight line, unquote. Will you explain this to me? You know, in the markets profession, we say that on average, you probably make about 12 to 15 percent returns, which is a very good return. Um, and you make this over five, seven, ten years. But if you look at every year, it's not like that. There are years when you make plus 30 percent, really great years like last year. And there, there are years like this year, which is a terrible year. Right. And the 12 to 15 percent is an average of all of these. But the average actually doesn't tell the saga. The saga is up, down, up again. And I think life is very much the same, right? If most of us, and I, I keep telling people this, if you look back at your career over 10 years or your life over 10 years, 
chances are you'll come back and say, hey, I didn't do so badly. You know, I've made progress from where I was in my career. I've given my family a better standard of living. I'm personally, all these things. But if you look at life on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll think, God, I hate my job today. God, I had a fight with my husband today. It's volatile. It's difficult. Even in your career, there will be years that are phenomenal career years, and there will be years that are terrible career years. Um, so just like the market, I mean, life is very up and down, but hopefully it trends upwards. About your own life, what would you say? Would you say something as average as, I haven't done badly, because uh -huh. you are seen as someone who's very successful and who's done very well? I would say I have taken advantage of lots of incredible opportunities that have come to me. These opportunities and everything make me very greedy to do a lot more. So well, I'm very grateful and very excited about where I've come. Um, I'm also very greedy about the future. So would you say this is just the beginning? Absolutely. Abhi to picture shuru hai. Abhi picture to abhi baki hai. What is the one leadership lesson you would like to give to those who you mentor? Don't try too hard to be a leader. Grow into the role of leadership. Um, you know, one of the things I've seen people often struggle with is that when you become a leader, it was a feeling that I need to give instructions. I need to get people to respect me. I need to do all of this. I need to command that position. Don't put that pressure on yourself. Win people's hearts, become a friend, and all of the other stuff will follow. What is that one thing that you wished had never happened to you? I don't have a great answer because I, I, I've never lived a life of regrets. Um, you know, I could say I wish the rejections had never happened, but no, um, I learned a lot out of that phase. So I don't think there's anything that I wish that never happened. You write poetry and you cook. Tell me about both. And you actually sold dal chawal and made money. I did. I sold dal chawal. And it's a decent business, yet, by the way, selling dal chawal to uh, rich kids. Um, yeah, I cook. Um, I learned how to cook while I started the food business. Uh, and I started the food business, as I said, uh, out of sheer compulsion. Uh, but I learned something about how to do a business uh, then. And I used to make 100 chapatis a night. Uh, while doing a joint degree, which was, uh, you know, not not fun because I was cooking from eight to two in the morning, and I used to do homework. And my husband, who was my classmate then, he's like, when you used to walk into class the next day, I think I used smelled like garam masala. He's like, I could just smell garam masala everywhere. Before I let you go, you must recite some lines for our viewers, given that you write poetry. I won't recite my own lines. I'll recite uh, three, four lines uh, from one of my favorite poems. It, it says that Nazar badlo to nazare badal jate hai. Nazar badlo to nazare badal jate hai. Soch badlo to sitare badal jate hai. Kashtiyan badalne ki zarurat nahi hai. Disha ko badlo to kinare badal jate hai. Radhika Gupta, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here with us and for this extremely, extremely interesting conversation. Thank you.